in FCPA compliance and translation? Join us on this episode of Frogcast as we discuss this with Jay Rosen. Hello fellow fraud fighters, I'm your host Alexis Bell for Fraudcast. Today we're talking with Jay Rosen about FCPA compliance translation considerations. Hi Jay. Hi Alexis. Nice to see you again. Yes, you too. Thank you for joining us. So You're you, had, you had a very interesting path. Tell me, how did you get to the place of FCPA compliance community? How did you get involved? Um, truly by accident. So I will try to take you back to the uh, beginning of this. This is actually my third career. I came out to California in the late 80s and worked in the motion picture business. Then I was in middle market investment banking. And uh, how I found myself in the world of FCPA is I was working at a translations company. And uh, we were having a dinner between all these partners who were putting together a, an end-to-end -end solution of um, – you know, basically e-discovery and translations, and they said that we should use this tool for every FCPA matter. Mm -hmm. And I nodded my head like I understood what FCPA was, and I went back home and I typed FCPA into Google, and no lie, the first thing that came out was Fairfax County Parks Administration. <laughs> and I said to myself, I'm sure this does not have anything to do with my relatives who live outside of D.C., so I better type it in again. And what came out was the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And that little light bulb went up above my head, and I said, well, how can I really differentiate myself between other folks in my company and in the profession who were selling translations? And I really wanted to take it upon myself to learn what FCPA was. So when they say um, a little knowledge can be dangerous, I've been putting together a little knowledge and a little bit more and now it's uh, been about eight years and uh, I've learned uh, enough to be dangerous or at least to hold my own with real fraudcasters like yourself. <laughs> so where do translation services solutions fit into the non-English language investigation protocol? Uh, it's a great question and that's probably one of the things that I've really learned over the years is that there's a certain um, order in which people or teams get assembled in a large global investigation. Uh, first on is usually outside counsel, and of course they're gonna hire those other participants to maintain privilege. Next step would be somebody from the forensics team that would usually have a, a global reach, be able to um, image those hard drives, acquire information, and then the next thing that they're, they're gonna look at is oh my God, we're doing an investigation in China, so we're going to be using Mandarin. So we need somebody who knows how to speak Mandarin. So they're going to go out and they're going to find document reviewers who are native speakers of Mandarin who also can translate into English. Well, they've thought about all that stuff, but they really haven't thought about, well, what happens when we get through this uh, document review, when we've got our core documents that are important, how are we going to translate them? Who's going to do that? And uh, more often than not, people sometimes come up with these solutions that kind of go all the way, but they really don't. So they might think that Becky down the hall speaks Spanish, so we'll let Becky do a translation. And Becky down the hall does speak Spanish, but she's also working with three other partners. And every hour that she spends working on the translation is less time that she can work with her partners. Also, Becky might not be a certified uh, translator, so she can't really certify that output. And if you're doing something that's going to the audit committee, the DOJ, the SEC, she can't. Uh, similar thinking might say let's utilize the document reviewers who are working on the project. Again, every minute that they spend translating 
is a minute that they're not flipping and coding documents. So there's an opportunity cost, and again, they don't have that requisite expertise to do it. Uh, the third choice might be somebody who's working for the forensics company, and the same pitfalls come up there. So what we've found is that there is a point where we really can help out in the process, but we have to either explain it to whether it's a, a, a chief paralegal, whether it's a third year associate, whether it's a partner. What I like to say is when you need translations on your investigation, you need to be thinking production. Because at that point when you're producing the documents, you've got relevant documents in non-English language you want to produce that. Now the thing is, you shouldn't be going to Google and typing in translation companies at that point. You should really have a relationship. If you're a global company and you do business all over the world, you should have one, if not a couple backup companies. God forbid you're ever in an investigation or litigation or just simply communicating things like ethics and compliance, you really need to build up a relationship with a language solution provider who can help you all deal with these subjects as they come up. So what kind of reach does your reach does your company have? How 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 far do you reach as far as geographic location? Oh great. So the company I work for is called Merrill Brink International mm -hmm. and we have a global reach. We have US locations in New York City and in uh, Minnesota in St. in St. Paul, Minnesota where we're headquartered. We have EU operations in London and Galway. I was on a call this morning at 5 a.m. West Coast time with Galway. And then we also have operations in Hong Kong. So what has um, really plays itself out nicely is there have been several large above-the-fold Wall Street Journal-type investigations where we've been able to have the teams in the PRC work with our group in Hong Kong and the teams in the EU work with us in London and the U.S. teams work with us in New York. So we find that on these large investigations, it's good to be able to have somebody who can engage with you in your time zone. But at the same time, we also have the ability to chase the sun. So I can have somebody call me at 6 p.m. Uh, in Los Angeles and say, I've got this spreadsheet with 230 Vietnamese terms. Can you turn this around to me by 6 a.m. tomorrow? So I've got a 12-hour window in Hong Kong at that time. It's 4 in the afternoon. So they can start processing that, hand it over to London, and then we can deliver it by the time the next morning. So um, not only are we global, but we're also 24-7 because we find that uh, for some reason associates love to send us projects at 8 p.m. on a Friday night, <laughs> and they would hate to have an, a voicemail saying, Welcome to XYZ Translation. Sorry, but we're not in right now. We'll get back to you on Monday morning. And that just doesn't cut it in the investigations or the legal world. You know, I really, uh, it reminded me of a case that I had. I wish I would have known you back then. I had a case um, years ago where uh, this was a, a mountain, an area called Weiwei Tenango. And um, at the bottom of the mountain, people spoke Spanish. And sort of like at the middle of the mountain, they spoke Spanish and Mayan sort of combined. And at the top of the mountain, they only spoke Mayan, and that was it. And I needed to speak to people across that entire mountain. And we it was a challenge to try to find somebody that spoke Ma Mayan. We eventually had to go to the university to find somebody to do that. But again, to your point from before, they weren't certified translator. Um, and this was a really big investigation to be able to do that. So um, I'm glad I know you now. <laughs> Me too. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think um, when I first started along eight years ago, I don't think um, people really thought about this as much. And part of it was, I think, uh, the industry is much more mature. Uh, we're seeing specific investigations in specific jurisdictions. So there's been a lot of pharma investigations over the last several years in APAC and specific, specific, specifically in China. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a lot happen in Latin America. There's a lot happening in Brazil. So in those intervening eight years, I think you've seen a lot of specialists come out. And now, um, thanks to the uh, ability of LinkedIn, I have 60 people who are lawyers that I all know in Brazil. 
and we know each other from LinkedIn, but the only time we get to see each other is if we go to a conference, if we're at ECI <laughs> or SCCE or something like that. So you not only um, can build that global database of contacts, but for a while um, I had some law firms calling me saying, look, we're going to Brazil and we're doing training. I know you only deal with written translations, but would you happen to know an interpreter who could go along? And I had a friend who was a former chief compliance officer who's fluent in Brazilian Portuguese. So I hooked her up with the law firm and she went out and helped them do their on-site education. So I think there's more speakers out there now and people are aware that you really can't cut the corners. At the end of the day, especially um, now, we're seeing a lot of these declinations that are coming out mm -hmm. from the Department of Justice. And part of that really has to do with their sensitivity to global communications. And if you read the majorities of these declinations and you look at the paragraph that says uh, the company did A, B, C, and D, every time you took a comma, if you took out what A was, that they had an ethics and compliance program, but B, not only did they have that program, but they translated it into local language. And I think mm -hmm. DOJ has probably done a very good job over the last year trying to set those expectations are what are the hallmarks of a good ethics and compliance program? What do you need to do to try to you know, move this from being what in the past may have been a checkbox exercise to being more of an active, living, breathing component that you can have your ethics and compliance people be out in the field and actually make a difference? Absolutely, and um, you know that reminds me that um, I had put together a, um, a CBT, a computer-based training, um, for Greece many years ago. Um, but we initially did it in English, and then I needed to hire somebody to translate that into uh, the Greek language. And to be honest, I didn't know anything about Greek, and so I wasn't able to myself vet and make sure that this was was good so I gave it to the CEO and said you know could you please look at this and tell me what you think before we roll this out and it was very interesting to me that the feedback that they gave me was that they could tell by the person's accent that it was a native um, person from Greece and not only that they could tell that she was um, highly educated and exactly what neighborhood she grew up in because of the the um, I guess the incantations that she had so it was um, it was really uh, well accepted because we had somebody to translate that was actually a, very, a local person for them so that took um, all of the compliance for the CBT that we gave and automatically they're accepting this as opposed to something for you know an American speaker that um, translated that maybe inappropriately or they didn't use the right words or they didn't understand you know what I'm saying it made a big difference. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're bringing up a, a big point, which um, you know you really have to take in the culture. So it's not only just about the language. So <laughs> when somebody says to us, "We need you to do a Spanish translation because we're doing a training," I have to ask, "Are you doing it in Spain? So I need EU Spanish. Do I need Latin American Spanish? Do I need Spanish for the U.S. Spanish for Mexico?" Mm -hmm. So not only do you have to get it right from the language perspective, but one of the things we do, um, say we're working with a global logistics company and they do business in 22 countries and they need 18 languages. Besides us doing the translation built into the cost structure of what we offer is we basically offer a set and then a draft of revisions. Mm -hmm. So after we've done those 18 different translations, we strongly suggest to our client that they find either a local compliance ambassador or an attorney or somebody they want to read that translation and give us their feedback. And the feedback usually falls into one of three buckets. The first bucket is usually, you know, there's a grammatical mistake mm -hmm. or we missed a period, easy to fix. Second thing, which is really interesting and kind of speaks to what you were saying about this Greek situation, is there may be certain terms of art. So there may be a word that means something internally in this company that means something differently in English. So that's something we definitely want to catch to take care of that, no problem. Now, bucket three is my favorite bucket. Uh, usually is um, some notes that have come from an expat who are living in the country now. 
they've had a whole two semesters of legal studies, <laughs> and they've taken it upon themselves, him or her, to drastically change your code of conduct. So then you go back to the client and said, did you know that the folks in, I don't want to blame anybody, in X jurisdiction said that it's okay to pay a facilitation payment? And they're like, no, that's not what our, you know, what our code says. So we catch all of that. And what just really helps the client is that we're able to take that whole commenting and um, doing the revisions. That's all work that we take upon ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's very less to having to herd the cats to get the, um, you know, to get the revisions, to get the comments. And what we do is at the end of every week, we send out a checklist saying we final German, Spanish, Portuguese. We're still waiting to hear back on the Turkish. So you can see as the project unrolls what we've done. And then the best part after having done an exercise like that is when you come back in 18 or 24 months, 80 to 90 percent of the heavy lifting's already been done. Mm -hmm. So when you're coming back, you're giving us a red line, you might only have 10 to 20% of the data that's changed, but there's a good shot that on that 10 to 20%, some of it has already been translated. So there's uh, incredible gains that you find on year two or year three because you're leveraging the work that was done the first time. And mm -hmm. again, if you do that with a professional language solutions provider, you're going to have that leverage, but if Becky down the hall is doing it and she's just doing it for Spanish, and then we've got to talk to uh, somebody in Paris and somebody in, in Germany, you're not going to have those same technology tools to leverage going forward. Absolutely. I think that's amazing. Um, tell me, how should a global organization with potential risk exposure go about finding and vetting a qualified language solution provider? So um, that, that's a great question, and, and that's almost like the follow-on to um, – what we talked about before with those three different solutions that you might come up with it. Mm -hmm. In today's world, um, you wouldn't, if you were a, a company that was listed on a stock exchange, you would not not have a big four auditor, right? That's right. just one of the way, three things you need to do business, and you also need to have lawyers. Well, you need to have people who can translate for you, and the question, there's probably two ways to go about it. If you're a big enough company, you could have an in-house translation desk where you would go to and say, look, you know, I've got this manual for a tractor and we need to do this. Now, what happens is an in-house desk would go out and place that work with different people. What we do is basically outsourced in-house desk. So you want to go to somebody and find out, do they have experience working with legal translations? Where do they have their translators? What are the translator's qualifications? What's an average turnaround time? Do you offer different levels of translation? Because you might only need a basic translation to understand a complaint that's come in off the hotline, but you might need to have a certified translation if you're in a patent dispute over some IP for mm -hmm. a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So those are the different types of questions. And unfortunately, unless you've worked an investigation or you've done work in this, a lot of people do not know the right questions to ask about translation. So they're like, well, do you charge by the document? Do you charge by the page? You know, how do you do this? So a lot of what I'm doing is I don't consider myself as selling, but I'm really more in the education and the teaching business. Mm -hmm. And whereas I can relate, it's not enough just to explain the translation process, but it's how does it work within litigation or how does it work if you're prosecuting a patent. So um, a lot of times people miss, uh, mistake who I am and what I can do. So I went to undergraduate at Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania. So when people see that I went to Wharton, they may think that I have an MBA. And if they don't ask me that question, I don't want to, you know, mess with their perception. <laughs> so same thing because of what I do in FTP. Um, we were just talking about our friend Leona Lewis and you appeared on her podcast, Masters of Disaster. So the first thing she started off is she said that, I, w I want you to meet Jay Rosen, who's an attorney. And I said, you know, time out. We got, we got to stop right there because I'm not an attorney. I just work with them. <laughs> so it's amazing, I think, the things that you pick up in your career 
that there are things that you do for a different reason, and at some point they all pay off and they come together. So uh, mm -hmm. I can say when I was five years old, I didn't say, gee, I'd love to throw up and sell certified legal translations. <laughs> but that's what I do now, and um, I, I enjoy it. And what I would say to go back to that question is, you know, I don't think it's so much about running an RFP because you can get RFP to death and people will answer the same question. So I think what you really need to do is uh, either, you know, take a look on certain websites that deal with our subject matter, whether it's the ACFE website or ECI or SCCE, and look at who are the people that contribute articles, who are the people that advertise. Number one, they're gonna be specialists in the space, but then go to them and say, look, if I had a global investigation in 12 different jurisdictions being in the EU, in Asia, and in South America, what would be involved with running an investigation? How would I go about hiring somebody like you? And, and how is something like that priced? Mm -hmm. So give them a real, um, you know, a real piece of business with the parameters to bid on and then see what they say. And a lot of times, sometimes people will get very hung up on the unit cost, on the unit cost, that it's X cents per word for Spanish and X cents per word for uh, Korean. You can always find somebody who's going to do it cheaper. The question is, is are they going to be able to deliver? And a story that I love to tell is I was in D.C. Um, meeting with an attorney from Allen & Overy. I was waiting with my boss at a Starbucks, and I get a text saying, um, I'm going to be a little bit late. We're having a problem in Sao Paulo. So this big Cheshire cat smile goes over my head because I'm like, I'm meeting a guy. My boss is with me. He's having a problem in Sao Paulo. Great. Tells me what's happening. I explain how we can help him. He says, I'll definitely put you guys up for the job. So on Monday, we get a call back, and he says, Unfortunately, the client had a relationship with a different vendor, so we went with that. So I said, fair enough, Kurt. You know, hopefully we'll work on something again. So I make a note, check back with Kurt in two weeks. So I said, Kurt, how's it going? He's like, not too good. Why? Well, the company that said they were going to give us human translations, they gave us machine translations. And... They didn't deliver what they said they were going to do. And I said, is there anything I can do to help you out? And since we're probably on a family Internet channel, they said, you could simply help me fix this mistake. We've been working with that client now for the last two years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's the thing that's instructive. We don't want people to get burned. We want companies to get qualified language solution providers who are going to help them out. But, you know, as we've talked about over the last few minutes, if they're not going to pick up the phone over the weekend or if they're not going to be able to offer you different levels or if they don't have the, um, you know, experience having worked in a certain kind of matter, you're going to get translations, but you may not get what you need. And the worst part, mm -hmm. I think you could probably attest to on the different investigations and things you've worked on, everybody hates to go back and redo it right a second time. Exactly. You'd really like the option to have those people on call for when you need them and you know who they are. And what I could say the best way to do is try somebody out, get a little piece of business, give them a five-page contract and look at how long does it take the vendor to get back to you? Do they deliver when they say they're going to deliver? If there's a problem, how do they handle it? You know, it's very easy to be somebody's salesperson when everything is going right. Mm -hmm. But when something goes wrong, that's where, you know, a company really shows their mettle because they're going to say, okay, this is how we're going to fix the problem. This is the plan. And, you know, every once in a while something is going to go wrong. So as long as people don't panic and they can come up with a solution, I would think they're the kind of people that I'd want to work with. You know, something that was very interesting to me when you and I talked before about the quality of your service was um, your vetting process for the people that do the translations. Do you want to speak to that for a second? Sure. Um, at the Just to, to figure out where people are in the world, we work with, at any given time, four to 6,000 independent contractors who work all around the globe. So that's the reach of where we can go. To, uh, again, you're talking to us either in the U U.S. or the EU or the APAC. So 
you know we can get you people. Everyone has at the bare minimum a four-year college degree. Most people have a postgraduate degree, so sometimes they're attorneys, sometimes they have doctorates, sometimes they have MBAs. Then after we've established that they're educated, they must have at least three years of experience working as a translator, and then we base group them by subject matter expertise. So if we were working on, I'll keep going back to my Korean patent for a smartphone, we would get somebody who's a native speaker of English that's bilingual with Korean, and that would understand either something about patent prosecution or electronics or the telecom industry. So that would be the bare minimum of somebody that we would look to staff. After we've looked at all that, we have a specific onboarding test that all our potential linguists have to take. One in less than one in 20 pass that test. So when you get to the end of the day, if you're one of these four to 6,000 linguists who we've onboarded, 95% of the people who want to work for our company have failed out. Mm -hmm. So uh, we feel that's a real, um, a real specific group of people who have talent and have the ability. And then furthermore, what we try to do is leverage that ability. So if we've had somebody work on uh, an FCPA matter in the PRC, or if we've had something doing something on a, uh, somebody doing something on Spanish litigation, we're going to try to use those people again because we've already built up a team. And the nice thing is, is we can flex them up or flex them down. So if you get hit with a lot of documents, we add more people, but if we have less documents, we take less. So all those folks are on us. It's not like you're keeping somebody on the bench and you're paying for them all the time. Mm -hmm. The other thing that people uh, don't really think about when they think about the translation business is these people who are linguists, they love to have the ability to go on vacation for a couple months and then they'll come back and work. So sometimes people say, well, can't you just have a translator come to our office? And we're saying that, you know, that defeats any benefit you're going to get by outsourcing that. Mm -hmm. When people do this job, they like the flexibility from working when they're at home or traveling or doing what they do. So that's the difference than having a resource that you've got uh, sitting there 40 hours a week. And, and this um, reminds me of my time in the motion picture business, but there used to be these scenes where the producer and the director would stand over the writer's pages and they're good. And that's not how translators work. But there are literally certain law firms where we have placed linguists who are on a 40-hour week retainer, and they sit there waiting for somebody to hand them a piece of paper to translate. Mm. And, um, you know, that doesn't really leverage the outsource capabilities of having people who are subject matter experts, people who can certify, and people who understand what they're doing. So those are like... You know, the things that you're going to want anybody to have, but in terms of how we look at, um, you know, looking at our group, our linguists, th those are the minimum requirements we have. The other thing just to keep in mind is they're not exclusive to us. So it is possible that somebody who has worked with us, you might be able to get work with them at another uh, translation company. The last thing that I forgot to mention is that this is very important that everybody has signed a, a confidentiality agreement. Mm -hmm. So with the nature of the work that we're doing, whether these are sometimes internal investigations or whether they're publicly known, still confidentiality is of a key concern. And that's what most of our clients, that's probably one of the first questions that they ask mm -hmm. is, who are the linguists? You know, what kind of confidentiality arrangement do you have with them? Excellent. Um, it makes me wonder, so um, I can imagine, you know, really large cases. I like the ability that you have to be able to flex up, as you said. Um, like, for example, um, let's say Parmalat, you know, just as an example, that case had over a million documents um, that were uh, submitted. So um, do you handle that large scale kind of cases if somebody were to have something like that? Or do you just take, do you have like a sweet spot that you have? Uh, no, there, there, there is no sweet spot, but one thing that I would speak to, you know, a case like Parmalat where they have millions and millions of documents, uh, we would try to come up with a solution together with the discovery provider to say, 
you know, is there a way that we can attack this document set? And one of the things that we're really well versed in is that um, handoff from e-discovery to human translations. So um, give me an example. One of the things that you're going to use an e-discovery tool for is to find duplicates. And mm -hmm. quite often, you know, you'll see one email, but it was sent to 30 people. Now, a less sophisticated LSP will charge you 30 times for translating that same document. What we will do is to be able to find the fact that if my client asked for 30 documents to be translated and 26 of them are copies, we will do one copy of the, the translation and then we will cut and paste that translation to those other documents. We'll still allow the base numbers to be there, we'll allow the chain of custody to be there, but we will have just saved 25 uh, you know, additional charges on that. So we try to figure out, is there a strategy? Um, sometimes, uh, one very interesting, uh, we just worked on a Hart Scott Rodino matter for um, a large beverage company based in St. Louis that was merging with some other global entities. And we had a situation where we had millions of words that we did language identification on so we could break up the English from the Portuguese, from the German, from the Spanish. Once we separated that out into different buckets, we went from million, billions of words to millions of words, and then we use that MT as something to look at to say, how can we classify these documents that are useful and which ones aren't? And then we took it to the last level, so we went from billions to millions to thousands of words, and then at that point, we were able to figure out these are things that we need to go to human translation. So as the, the big data just increases, uh, people are trying to use machine translation and also early case assessment and computer assistant uh, tra translation, all sorts of different technology tools to say, is there a way that we can pare this data down because there's so much, there's not only the hard drive, right, but it's people YouTube posting and people posting on Facebook and LinkedIn, so how can we work as a partner with the legal team, with the mm -hmm. forensics team, how can we use the experience that we see from the language size to leverage it and try to decrease the number of words you need to translate? I think that's very exciting because, you, as you know, that's an iterative process, right? You keep going back and refining mm -hmm. and making it better and going back. Um, so that, that actually brings a question to mind. Um, I can see how what you do would fit very nicely with um, the, the documents. and. Um, do you also do things like transaction level databases? Because I know that you know the the uh, English is is usually what you see in business. But I've had a number of cases where we needed to actually analyze data, and it was in a different language. Is that something that your firm does, or have you seen any need for that? Well, what we'll see sometimes is um, we will get large Excel spreadsheets that are you know like either. Um, inventory list or orders or commission lists. So um, we're not actually going into the database, but they will give us um, you know, native usable files, so PowerPoint, Word, Excel, that we can go in and we can translate. But we're not, um, it's not like it's a wholesale one for one translation into the database. So um, you know, I, I still think that um, it all is gonna the it's it's all gonna live within that e-discovery tool. Mm -hmm. So if we're able to translate and put stuff in, again, say we were looking at maybe um, financials over a ten-year period, as long as we did the translation on the most recent one for what the line items were, again, we would go back in and try to cut and paste. So we're not charging you, you know, for mm -hmm. seventy or one hundred fifty page annual report. So we're going to try to do that. Um, I would just say that we're all about finding the duplication and doing the translation, but we're not about running those specific searches. So that would still be up to the investigations team or whoever the e-discovery provider was. But mm -hmm. I think your point, Alexis, is that with this big data, the more and more we can leverage it. And sometimes, you know, you can search on that through foreign language key terms depending on, you know, how robust your e-discovery tool is. But there are also, you know, organizations out there who will help you with that data 
and also again help you as you know with you know finding those uh, non-English speaking attorneys who can help you review the data. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking like as an example that um, I know that we did a conflict of interest case once um, and it was um, in another language and we were still able to to parse the data out and get to the the ones that we wanted to look at because it didn't really matter who the vendor was it didn't really matter what the amount was it was about the the the, the footprint the fingerprint of, of the behavior of that data so once we were able to pull that out then we had a much smaller list um, that we sent out for a translation so that's the kind of thing that you would be able to do once it's pulled out and now it's in the size of like an Excel spreadsheet then you could do that yeah I mean that, that that's easy to handle um, you know uh, so I, again the, the thing that we're trying to think about is there's a lot of creativity that we need to do and I think on your part from being an investigator you want to find creative ways or you want to think about well how did the fraud happen here what are the logical steps and we want to try to um, add that not from our a fraud perspective but from a linguistics perspective mm -hmm. so you know th I, again um, one of the things that we can't stress more although there's not a large need for having a, an LSP work with you at the beginning of the process when you're starting to come up with key terms or if you're working with a data solution that does not do the, the language separation like I described those are points of inflection that we can help on the front, of, mm -hmm. front end of an investigation they're really not very costly at all but to your point they can really help improve uh, the output of an investigation by taking a way to look at the data and you know more often than not um, your big four or your forensic provider may have some type of language identification they may have native speakers who can come up with those um, you know key terms to look for but one of the things that you probably get by leveraging an LSP is that they have probably worked on other matters within those jurisdictions mm -hmm. So if we're able to le leverage those same people, they may even know what the term is for payment or bribe. So I think if we all work together and share best practices, there's a lot we can learn from an investigative team. There's a lot we can learn from, learn from a law firm. And I think, um, you know, in, in some circles we're considered just a, a fungible vendor who sells, you know, widgets that they think translations are equal. And... Um, just like my friend and Alan and Overy, we were able to demonstrate quite effectively that not all translations are equal. So uh, back to that, you know, due diligence and, and being aware of who you partner with, it's never too soon to find out who those folks are. God forbid you don't need them for an investigation, but there also are positive things that you might need foreign language due diligence for if you're doing an acquisition, if you want to check on if the company that you're going to do business with has a good ethics and compliance program, that's probably a good use of a language solutions provider. Absolutely. And then any sort of training that you could do as well. Um, and didn't you mention when, when we were speaking before about a, a compliance app? Wasn't there someone that was doing that? Yeah, this was really exciting. That um, This is a project we worked on for the Ford Motor Company. And about two years ago, they came out with an app called The Right Way, which is available both on uh, the iTunes Store and the Google Play. And basically what they did is they took their code of conduct and made it an interactive application. I love so, it. Um, if, I love it. I think sorry? that's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So um, if I'm in China during the Lunar New Year and I want to see how much I can spend on a gift, I can type that in. So I, I happen to connect at Compliance Week with the Chief Compliance Officer at Ford, and she reached out to me once they had done the English rollout, and they wanted to translate that into six additional languages. So they gave us the, um, the text on that, we translated it into the six languages, and then they localized it. So that's something, you know, we're seeing more and more out there that, and I'm sure, you know, you've seen this over the past few years too, that your codes of conduct are moving from being 20-page dense single-line English things to being 
really visually pleasing. They're having you know blowout boxes. There are questions. So they're trying to meet uh, employees at a different level by saying, look, this isn't a legal responsibility, but this is something we want to give you to help you in your day-to-day interaction on how you do your job. And if you ever come up with anything that might be a red flag, this is the way to escalate it, and this is how we can help you. So, you know, that's something that Ford's doing. And, and I think when we were at the ECI, they actually spoke, said that if anybody wanted to reach out to them, they would, you know, help share uh, the app and see if there's a way that, you know, you could use that for your own company or your own industry. So I think those kind of tools out there from an ethics and compliance standpoint are really exciting to see. It's very exciting because, you know, it's absolutely critical that employees get that information and making it interactive like that and, and to your point, visually pleasing. Um, and then they can they can carry it with them. I, I think it's a fabulous idea. Well, Jay, is there any last thing that you want to share with us before you go? Uh, yeah, I would just like to say that if anything that you and I spoke about uh, spurs anybody's imagination or they would like to get – uh, for their info, best ways to reach me via email. Uh, it's uh, my first name, last name, so J A Y dot Rosen, R O S E N, and it's at Merrill Brink, M E R R I L L B R I N K dot com. And then uh, you also can reach me via my uh, mobile, which is 310 So, um, as you see, uh, I'm at no loss for words, so I'm happy to talk about anything. And it, it doesn't even have to be translation-based, uh, but anything to do with FCPA, ethics, or compliance, I think we all know it's good to talk with colleagues out there and to learn about best practices. Mm-hmm. So if there's anything here we discussed today, uh, I'd be happy to talk about it in greater detail. So. Great. Well, thank you so much for being a fraud fighter and making a difference. Thank you for having me, Alexis, and hope to see you soon. Great. Okay. Bye-bye.